Hey everybody, it's Christian and welcome to the first video in 2025. Last year I built this brand new storage server. I was experimenting with Unraid as my new NAS operating system and I used a very power efficient CPU, the Intel N100. And I was quite excited about this project. It even now replaced my bigger TrueNAS installation completely. So I'm not using TrueNAS anymore in my home lab, not even as a VM on Proxmox. But honestly, this project also caused me a few headaches because I've made a terrible decision for one of the hardware parts and I thought it would be nice to make a quick follow-up this year to address it and I also still owe you the results of the performance and power consumption testing so that's exactly what we are covering in this video. Hope you're gonna enjoy it. Alright, so first of all I want to apologize to you because I messed up in the first video recommending this crappy NVMe SATA controller card or whatever you want to call it. So my idea was I just put this into the NVMe slot on the motherboard and this would allow me to connect to the 8 port hard drive backplane of the storage server case so then I could just use the PCIe slot for the 10 gigabit network card and I could still connect up to 8 hard drives and because the motherboard also has two internal SATA ports I could use them for internal SSDs and I'm fine with all the interface ports that I got pretty simple. However the thing I did not notice was that this controller card has a few problems when you're using it in a NAS. And uh, let me just give you some context about that. What are these issues? So this card uses a controller chip, the S-Media JMB585, which usually only supports up to five hard drives. And to make this particular card working with eight hard drives, it uses a technology that is called port multiplication. On paper, this sounds like a pretty nice technology, yeah, because it allows one SATA host port to connect to multiple SATA drives to expand this storage capacity of a controller card, effectively giving you more hard drives you can connect to your storage server. But some of you mentioned in the comments of my last video that using cards with port multiplication comes with a range of potential problems and limitations. That's why it is not a good idea to use those cards in storage builds because the speed has to be divided among all the connected devices, which can lead to reduced performance, especially under heavy load. But it can also cause some bigger problems with RAID systems and hot swapping latency issues, firmware and driver issues. Also in the Unraid forums, people clearly say don't use port multiplication cards when building storage servers. So that wasn't really a good pick for a controller card. By the way, I also was running into some weird issues with this storage server. For example, every few days the server completely stopped working for no reason and I needed to reboot it until it uh, worked again. And I believe the problem was this controller card. At least that's my suspicion because the issues didn't occur again after I changed it. So thank you so much for everybody correcting me in the comments. That was really helpful to find the root cause. Uh, luckily, you can simply replace this card without any downside. Sides. It's also not the most expensive card anyways. I just got a new NVMe controller card here, the S-Media 1166, which only has six SATA ports now, so two ports less than the older card, but it doesn't need port multiplication to achieve it, and that's the important part. So this card should work much more reliable and even faster. We will later, by the way, also take a look at the performance metrics as well. However, there are two more things to consider here. First, because it got two ports less than the older card, I needed to add another controller card when I wanted to use all of the eight hard drive base that the storage case has. That's why I've added this new small PCIe 3.0 card. Even with the PCIe X1 slot on the motherboard, it should be fast enough for four magnetic hard drives. And this model, of course, also doesn't have port multiplication, so that should be fine now. And the second thing you have to consider, these cards have a different connector. So they just have the regular SATA ports you will find in any desktop computer. But because the storage server case has a backplane that uses a different port interface. I needed to get two different cables to connect them so that I now have four SATA ports on one side and the SFF8087 port for the backplane on the other side. Just to mention, if you want to buy these cables here and do the similar setup that I have, be careful when you're buying these cables because there are two versions of them. Make sure you get the ones that have the four SATA ports at the host and the SFF8087 
87 as the target. These cables don't work the other way around. Of course, I will put your links to the parts that I know got updated for the storage server case in the description box down below. Now, I have to say after all of these experiments and issues that I ran into, I understand why many people may recommend professional server equipment using proper LSI controller cards and bigger motherboards. I have to admit, this is not really my world, yeah, I just like to keep it simple and I enjoy building my own stuff using regular desktop components. But the lesson that I've learned from all of these projects now is that if you ever want to build a home server yourself, do a good research on the hardware parts that you plan to use. Carefully check if they are capable of what you're trying to achieve. And yeah, you will still likely run into some issues you have to fix because it can be very challenging, especially if you want to keep it at a low price, but you still want to have enough performance and a low power consumption ideally this isn't easy as it seems but after all i'm super happy that i did this project i've learned a ton of new things and now my storage server runs smooth and fast by the way, speaking about smooth and fast, let's also talk about the performance metrics. Of course, I wanted to do some speed tests with this new adapter when copying files from and to the network shares of the server. Unfortunately, I still don't have a 10 gigabit network card in my Mac Mini. Hopefully that's going to change somewhere this year. When the Mac Studio finally gets refreshed, I'm literally just waiting for Apple to announce a new Mac Studio with the M4 chip so I can upgrade my setup. But for now, I just tested the performance using one of my virtual machines on Proc. Xbox. This of course has also a 10 gigabit network card and I used the tool FIO for the performance metrics. I think this is a nice tool, very simple. I did some tests to measure the read and write performance when copying a 10 gigabyte large file to the Unraid array over NFS. And surprisingly, the performance first wasn't that great as I expected. I got somewhat about 100 megabytes per second write speed. On paper, the hard drives should have a higher speed, so I've researched searched in the Unraid forums again for what other people are saying about the performance and I found out something interesting about the write speed in the Unraid array that I also want to quickly show to you. Because when you're using the Unraid array, so no storage pool with BDRFS or ZFS, just a regular array function, the write speed is heavily impacted by the write mode settings for the Unraid disk array options. By default, Unraid is using a so-called read modify write mode, which uh, allows it to maintain real time parity so that means when you're copying a file to the Unraid array it also makes sure that the data is immediately protected by the parity drive which makes a lot of sense to me yeah if you write new data to the array of course you want to make it protected uh, but it also has an impact on the write performance meaning it is a bit slower of course you can change this setting there's also a different write mode existing that you can turn on in the disk settings of Unraid this is called the turbo mode or also reconstruct write so this is a bit faster because it uses a different technique to write the data to the array. I'm not going into all of the technical details here. If you're interested, I leave you a link to the documentation below. And uh, certainly after changing this setting, I got somewhat about 130 megabytes per second write speed, which is about 30% faster in my case. But as you can imagine, there's also a downside to this new turbo mode. First, it consumes more power because it requires all the drives of the array to be spun up. And and all the drives must be reading without any errors, according to the Unraid's documentation. So if you're now thinking about this, whether you want to enable it or not, it is of course up to you. But honestly, to me, the turbo mode setting in Unraid doesn't sound so nice because it's not really that much faster to make a difference. I mean, we are still talking about speeds that are so low, it's not even utilizing the 10 gigabit network card interface. And I personally prefer a real-time parity protection while copying new files and a lower power draw. So long story short, I just turned this setting back to the default settings, ac accepting the slower speeds when I'm riding to the Unraid array. Because there's also another thing to this, if you really want to increase the writing speeds in Unraid, I think there are better ways to achieve that. For example, by using a cache pool. As I've explained in my previous Unraid video, I'm not writing the data directly to the array. Instead, I'm using a faster BDRFS cache pool on the two internal one terabyte SSD drives. And this allows me to have a fast write speed of about 460 to 500 megabytes per second. This is definitely in the range where a 10 gigabit network card starts to make sense. And at midnight, there is a planned scheduler job in Unraid that writes back the data from the SSDs to the larger Unraid array. 
one thing you should keep in mind though is when adding a cache pool, it only increases the write speed of your Unraid server. Because when the data is once written to the array by the scheduler at midnight, it doesn't get back into the cache again. So when you need to access the files at the next day, it has to read it from the slower Unraid array. However, the good news here is that the Unraid array is a bit faster when reading the data instead of writing. I even got faster writing speeds with the new ASM1166 controller chip than before with the old JMB585 that used the port multiplication. So the old one was about 150 megabytes per second reading speeds. Now after adding this new adapter, I get 180 megabytes per second, which again proves I probably should have listened to you guys earlier and it was the right decision to replace this stupid port multiplication card. But yeah, at least I could learn something with these experiments. So just to summarize it again, writing speed is really fast with 460 to 500 megabytes per second because of the cache pool and 180 megabytes per second reading speeds. This is still reasonably fast for this build. It is obviously slower than my old TrueNAS storage server that used a ZFS file system with lots of RAM for read and write caching. But the new storage server also has some great advantages and it is totally sufficient for my use case. And this is probably the most interesting thought here at the end that I'd like to share. Because with Unraid, and especially the Unraid array, you never can build a super fast hot storage. So hot storage means when you need high availability and quick access for frequently used data, such as disks for virtual machines or database applications over NFS. That just doesn't work great with the Unraid array. And there's no real way to increase the reading speeds. This is a situation where you should use either TrueNAS or use storage pools like ZFS or PTRFS in Unraid. But the Unraid array is simply perfect for a cold storage. Storage, so when you don't need to frequently access the data. And this totally fits my use case. For instance, I'm using this storage server primarily for storing my video projects and taking backups from my application and Proxmox server. So this is like an archive server for me where I want to backup something fast, but I just rarely need to access the files from the backups again. And then the Unraid array is wonderful because it is super fast when taking the backup and it is very power efficient. I can mix any hard drives that I got lying around and when I need to restore something, it's okay when it takes a bit longer because that rarely happens. So in the end, for my use case, I think it was absolutely the right decision to move to Unraid as my new NAS operating system, also because it's more efficient. By the way, this takes me to the second comment that I also often got, that was how much power does my new storage server actually consume? Because I said it in the video, this new Unraid server is more power efficient than my old server with TrueNAS, but I never told you the actual number, so. Here they are. When all drives are spun up, the server consumes about 48 watts on idle. So I'm not running any containers or virtual machines on this device. It's just there for storage and most of the time not doing anything. And to break it down, I've measured the idle power consumption by removing some of the components one by one so I could find out what power each part nearly consumes. When the server runs with just the motherboard, the CPU, the memory and the power supply alone, it consumes about 13 watts on idle. I know this sounds still a bit high for the small Intel N100 chip that the motherboard has, so that's why I also wanted to do some tests with a different power supply, where I indeed could get the power consumption a bit lower to about 10 or 11 watts on average. But unfortunately, this other power supply that I used for testing that didn't fit in the case, and also because I'm quite happy with the C Sonic power supply that takes the air from the front of the storage server case. I think this is a great power supply for a smaller two unit rack server case. So that's why I just wanted to keep it, even if it consumes one or two watts more power. So the next part is the 10 gigabit network card, which is an older Intel X520 PCIe 2.0 chip. So this one doesn't support the latest and greatest power efficiency options introduced in PCI Express 3 and 4. This card alone takes about four to five watts on idle. Of course, when you're transferring data over this network interface, it does even consume a bit more. But I think it is absolutely necessary to have for my storage server. I just want a fast network connection, so I'm definitely going to keep it. Then we have the two internal SSDs. I think that's another one or two watts. And then finally, the biggest part, the magnetic hard drives and the controller cards. So I got four Western Digital Red drives with four terabytes. They consume about 
five, maybe six watts each. So in my case, it was about uh, 24 watts in total uh, when they're spun up, of course, and they're doing some work. And for the small PCI Express uh, SATA card and uh, this new ASM1166 NVMe controller card, I don't have an exact number, but if you calculate the total 48 watts idle power consumption of the entire system minus all the other parts that I've tested, you get about four to five watts for both, which sounds a reasonable metric for me. I, uh, so again, I think these are really great numbers. As I said, you probably could optimize a few things here and there, like adding a smaller power supply or using a different 10 gigabit network card and other hard drives, of course. But I think for a storage server build, I, uh, this isn't too bad. And the cool thing is, because I'm using the Unraid array as my new NAS operating system, which allows me to automatically spin down the disk when they are not in use, the system consumes most of the time, so when it's not doing anything, just about 31 to 32 watts on idle. But this is the lowest number that I could catch on average. I think then this is an absolutely outstanding power consumption compared to my older TrueNAS server that power consumption was about like 150 watts or so. This is a huge improvement and exactly what I aimed for because my goal wasn't necessarily to achieve the lowest power consumption possible. I simply wanted something significantly more efficient than before so I could run a few other power hungry devices at home. But yeah, these are some of the updates that I've done to my storage server. So please let me know if there is anything else that you'd like to see in the future or if you have any other suggestions on how I could improve my home lab server builds. I'm always happy to get your feedback. I appreciate it. And yeah, then somewhere in March or April, I think it's time for a new home lab tour. So if I'm done with all of the projects. If you'd like to see all all of these things that you're interested in, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, especially to all the supporters and members of my channel. And then I'm going to catch you in the next video. Take care. Bye bye.